recording. Welcome everyone to Pivoting Online. We are now in week four of the course and things are moving along uh, well. Some good participation, great conversations, and uh, great to have everybody here. Uh, let's do a quick run around from the facilitator end. Matt, how are you? How's it going? Well, it feels like a big, um, you know, real life groundhog day as today seems to be just like yesterday and the day before and the week before and the month before. And uh, that, that's all I can say because it is, it's getting very repetitive. Even the online arguments are repeating themselves with people blogging about stuff that happened the last week as well. So that's mainly what I've been seeing. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I hear you in that regard as well. I, I, I mean, that's a good way of looking at it. Well, a depressing way to be honest, but it, it really is a sense of we're just repeating processes now. And in some ways, one of the things I found interesting with this whole onlining thing that everyone's dealing with right now is we're repeating things that have been answered 20 or 30 years ago. And by things that have been answered 20 or 30 years ago, I'm talking about a lot of the discussions on media, the discussions on the impact of of learning design and, and the list goes on. And I think it's gonna get more pronounced because once we're, and, and we're seeing already, the conversation has shifted. It's no longer about getting online. We're starting to see conversations about student support, we're starting to hear that we may not be open in fall of this year. Some are just saying, look, let's write off this next academic year, start in 2021. Read an article yesterday that suggested we'll be practicing social distance until 2022 or until there is something that looks like the, uh, you know, uh, a vaccine or something comes along or so on. And it drives me nuts. Like I just tweeted this earlier this morning, but Bill Gates said something like, oh, bad idea to defund the World Health Organization in the middle of a pandemic. What happens? Uh, I never should have followed those comments or those replies to that tweet. If you think ed tech is toxic, dear Lord, that is insane, the quality of the conversation there. Anyway, happy thoughts. Tanya, how are you? All right, not hearing you. I think I've co-hosted you. So let me try to make sure, make Tanya the co-host. Let's try, I thought I did that already. Tanya, can you try now? Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. I couldn't unmute myself that you had muted me. I don't know, I think it's something, I'm not sure what it is, but yeah. Um, you might have to unmute us multiple times. Um, yeah, I'm sure like everybody uh, that's joining today is that just feeling a bit underwater. I know like many of you, it's like working till the minute I get up until I go to bed because everybody wants so much information. I, I'm feeling frustrated. Um, I think sort of like George had mentioned in that um, there are just um, nonsensical conversations that are happening and it's... Um, and I think it's twofold, um, you know, the idea that we are leaving social distancing, um, you know, in the next few weeks or anytime soon and gonna pick up summer courses or the summer term um, at, like you normally would, it's just not gonna happen or even in the fall. And so, you know, sitting through meetings um, nationally and internationally on different groups and committees and boards and, you know, hearing like, actually actively sitting in a meeting where people are participating um, and they are anticipating like August face-to-face -face events or September or October, November. And I'm like, what are, why am I in this meeting? This is not worth my time to be planning. Um, I'm not getting on a plane anytime soon. I don't care what anybody says. <laughs> This is not gonna happen until I have a vaccine or an antibody test, me and my daughter and my family, and that's just how it goes. And so um, it's just uh, really interesting. And too, like Georgie brought up, you know, I taught my first fully online class in 2001. And so at that time, you know, a couple decades ago, like was able to look through the literature and be informed. Um, and it's just like um, a lot of people want to push back on the advice that we give them because it's not what feels comfortable or natural to them, you know, like hosting three hour Zoom sessions to replace their face to face. And so, um, and luckily I've just stopped 
trying to uh, respond to folks that don't want to believe me and my 20 years of one experience teaching, but my research and scholarship, and, and they can figure it out on their own. I think failure is a great thing for everyone to experience uh, and learn from that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I <laughs> Yeah, I know. I was just going to say that that uh, the timeline, it, it, you know, even if you just look at China, which if nothing else, they're probably two to three months ahead of the rest of the world. Uh, their universities aren't there yet, meaning if they're not there yet, and apparently if you believe the numbers coming out, you know, they, they had a, a localized Wuhan impact. So if, if they're not open now, we can say at minimum, we're not going to be open three months from now. And this is after China has already cleared the hurdle of, you know, bringing it in under control. So uh, there, there is, in my eyes, I'll give it in mathematically a very vague percentage of exactly zero likelihood that will be fully operational by fall. I think too, in talking to my um, friends in Asia, China and where this happened had a very different containment procedure than we did in the United States. So we could even push that out further, you know, and, and to the point that we still have people that are not necessarily social distancing probably in the way they should be. And in Singapore, I was talking to one of my um, best friends and colleagues and she, they just um, put down the strict like no leaving your house thing just now and that's in Singapore. So I just feel uh, like we're, yeah, like we're months off and this is a great time for everyone to learn how to truly and effectively teach online before the fall term. And so I know that we uh, want to really hope to be back to face-to-face -to, -face to some extent and that the universities financially rely on, on some of those um, expenses that are charged to students, but I just don't see it happening in the near future. Well, the difficulty with Singapore, what makes it so amplified is they initially contained it. And they didn't close down schools the first cycle, but then what happens is until you absolutely lock your border down, or in the case of China, weld shut the doors of apartment buildings, you, you know, this, this, it'll keep coming up. And so I think the only secure strategy that, that I can imagine right now is a vaccine or a really effective treatment. That's the only thing that I can see is going to allow something that looks like uh, opening before uh, the, the fall semester. But it, at this point, like I said, I, I don't see it. And other countries, like you said, Singapore, they're finding even early containment has resulted in subsequent surges. And that's just how it works. If you look at the numbers from the uh, 2008 uh, pandemic, it was a similar effect. There was a huge early hump and then a, a second more prolonged one because that's just how these things go until they've moved through the population. Megan, how are you holding up? I'm holding up. <laughs> um, I'm actually going this morning to get some COVID-19 testing done myself. So um, holding up is the way to go. Um, I've, I have a really bad cough and they've relaxed the requirements here in South Australia and they're encouraging anyone with cold or flu-like systems to get tested over the next two weeks. So I'm going to go first thing this morning at 9 a.m. and get tested myself and my son because that's I feel the responsible thing to do. Um, other than that, it seems like that initial, let's just get content up and let's get ourselves into Zoom up stage has started to uh, tinker down um, and people are starting to realize that they now need to think about other elements of online teaching other than just putting up their content and getting their students into Zoom which is really good to hear and see. I'm starting to think about, okay, my students need to interact. How do I do that? I need to assess my students differently. How do I do that? So it's nice that at least um, that initial urgency to just get things online has now um, resolved to people thinking a little bit more broadly about what online teaching means. Um, and, you know, just like Tanya said and George said, I don't think this is ending anytime soon which is also exciting because that actually now gives us time to work with our academics properly, give um, suggestions and encouragement to what online teaching should be about. Um, Tanya, you said that 2001 was when you first taught online. I think it was about 2005 when I took my first online class as a student online. Um, 
but you know, I mean, this is the thing. It's and I've been saying it around. Okay, again. Way to go. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just sorry. I'm just thinking of the days. I didn't mean to say it that way at all. I am. <laughs> no, I just, very, yeah. it was very old when I took my <laughs> first online class. I am aging myself. I was very old. It was yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's been around for decades, right? So, and what we're seeing is actually online teaching that was happening 20 years ago, not online teaching that, that as we know it right now. So we have the online, you know, well-designed courses with interactivity, with teamwork, with assessment built in, with short video clips, not, you know, long Zoom sessions or anything like that, or long videos um, that have been happening for years. And now we've got this other surge of trying to get everybody online really quickly. But I think it's exciting over the next few months because if if we can actually start thinking about that next term being online and not this, oh, well, maybe there's a chance it'll be face to face. So let's just plan for that. But actually think, you know, realistically, it's probably going to be online. And I know that makes it difficult for people who teach courses that are practicals, that have internships, that have laboratory requirements. And, you know, maybe those sort of things do need to be deferred until we are back to face to face. But at least the other courses that we know that don't have that element um, or even those that do and it's like well maybe we just have to defer that practical because that's just not feasible um, this year is we can now start saying okay let's look at your content let's chunk it down into what is you know bite size let's look at your video you've got time now to do a proper video that is only about 15 minutes long and not 45 you know think about your zoom sessions as you know the, the latest thing I've been thinking about is the notion of online flipped learning. So we know there's flipped learning where we're trying to encourage our academics not to go into the lecture hall and lecture for two hours and have them have students do the activity and the watching the video stuff on their own. Come into class, do something interactive. Can we do that online and what does that look like? Um, is, is one of the things I'm starting to grapple with myself in that if we can start getting our academics to start thinking of, say, Zoom, what we're doing right now, we're not lecturing here today we're answering some questions we could be putting ourselves into a group and doing an activity and sharing it back and then using the asynchronous part for something else i don't know it's it's a work in progress but um i think it's exciting and i hope academics will start to get over that challenge of first getting online um that they had in the past four weeks to be able to start looking at how they might do things differently next semester That's a great point, and I think that that is uh, the pedagogical changes that are more sustained than get stuff online uh, are they take time. If you have a week to move online, you can basically just take your existing PowerPoints and teach them in a regular type of a manner. But if you have a semester or a few months, then you have the ability to change your curriculum, change the or not not your curriculum, even change the way that your curriculum is communicated, the degree of active engagement that you allow and build into students. You can start to implement the community of inquiry model, for example, in a more precise way that, rather than in a panic way. Um, and, but anyways, uh, keep us informed about how the, uh, the test goes and uh, hope you're feeling better soon. Justin. Yeah, so there are two things that I'm, I'm definitely seeing more. Um, and my wife works at a community college. And um, I think some of the things are some of the other systemic challenges that we're kind of facing in terms of advising, like how do we advise our students and be able to support them on the student success side, uh, reaching out in, in ways that you know, we had been doing, it, it, just doesn't, it just doesn't work the same in this environment. So um, I think we're starting to see some of these things pop up a, a little bit more um, as we've got a little bit of time, as well as, I mean, questions about admissions and of course, as George was mentioning too, like whether or not we're even gonna offer an on-campus component in the fall. Which, which I agree, I don't think that's that's very likely. Um, so I'm starting to notice, obviously, these things a lot more. But then, of course, then you see those articles of like the University of Oregon, where you know 300 staff getting furloughed during that time, and thinking about the impact that's going to be on uh, for supporting the transition. Um, and a lot of universities already don't have a super great online infrastructure. Um, so you know, definitely some concerns about that, and seeing how that's going to go. Um, that's uh, 
it's a little bit terrifying. But um, the second thing is um, just uh, as we continue to offer professional development at my university and I'm having continued contacts with faculty and you know, Matt and I have both been working really hard uh, to help our Center for, for Research on Teaching and Learning Excellence and the Faculty Affairs uh, Division to, to be able to support, you know, this transition. And, um, you know, it's one of the things that I, I did for, for quite a while was help uh, run a professional learning community program. And originally we set it up as sort of like this bottom up sort of grassroots way of being able to um, get some get some people in the, in the colleges that could be more of a sort of like champions and be willing to try some things and promote some culture uh, a culture of you know, innovation and, and just and just you know be willing to try maybe one small thing in your class um, to, to, to kind of shake things up um, as you saw that was, that was necessary um, we tried you know different um, you know, different different approaches so sometimes we'd uh, focus a little bit more on inclusion of uh, learning analytics and, and using you know your educational data and learning practice or uh, trying blended learning practices or you know, just things like that and, and it's interesting um you know, looking back at, at my time and helping facilitate that program and then seeing some of those things continue now so this is like 2014 and still it's 2020 now and i'm hearing a lot of the exact same things and um you know a lot of the resistance and and you know when you see certain uh, particularly um, STEM fields. Um, I've, I've always had the. I've seemed like I have a larger challenge of getting people to necessarily think about changing the way that they approach things. Um, and also, um, this is the idea of having a lot of control of your class and um, cheating is, is another thing. I know we brought that up multiple times in these live sessions, but um, it's just it's, it's just interesting when you, there are certain mindsets that are that are more difficult in certain it seems like to be in certain disciplines over others. And it's, it's just some, some interesting, uh, some interesting challenges um, to be able to, to be able to get people to even sort of take some steps. But sometimes it's just that little step, like in the PLC of, oh, well, this thing was kind of interesting and maybe I'll try to do some things. And then the next semester they try a little bit more. Um, you know, we don't have the luxury of that, unfortunately, right now. Um, even with the, the fall, you know, we have a, a summer time here, but I mean, people still have a lot of things going on. And, and one thing that keeps coming up uh, too is, man, how are we getting time to get our research done? <laughs> um, and all the other uh, service related activities um, as, as you know, faculty on a campus. Holy cow, like all those things falling by the wayside. I don't know my research is definitely falling back a lot too. And um, I'm not even having like a big deal teaching or like that. So, um, you know, there's just a lot, of, a lot of other bigger challenges that are out there right now. But, um, you know, I encourage everybody to keep up the good fight. And, you know, I know that right now it's, it's a tough time. You know, hope that this course can be something that can be supporting going forward and one of the things that has a big impact right now is there's a lot of departments that in the past had to struggle to get people to show up so i know nagan you're familiar with this as well with uh with your your unit and um you know anyone that works in sort of an ed tech or a technology support department on campus teaching and learning center uh, has for many years struggled to get people to show up to workshops and and whether you like it or not um, and it's it's unfortunate that this is a positive thing in the middle of a crisis but really this is an incredible opportunity for these departments to to reach out and influence and impact staff because it is just unprecedented where you suddenly you can run a webinar that you know, used to you'd have a workshop and six people would show up and now you can have a webinar and, and uh, your room fills up because everybody has questions. So I'd appreciate any reflection from any of you on what have you seen from the university support services like Teaching and Learning Center and others, how are they holding up in the middle of this? Well, we're holding up. Um, we're incredibly busy. Um, and like I was saying, initially, it was all about um, how do I get my content online? How do I use Zoom? Um, it was at a point where we were running three out uh, one and a half hour Zoom workshops, probably not the best example, but one and a half hour Zoom workshops, three of them a day for about three or four weeks. Um, and, and there were a lot of people in those. So they, they were booked out. That's why we, we were running them once a day. Then we made them three times a day. It was absolutely insane. So we were trying to get so many people over this hump because their immediate reaction was, oh, I do a tutorial. Okay, I'm going to do it in Zoom now. I do a lecture. Okay, I'm going to do it in Zoom now. Um, so it was all that push to get people into Zoom. Now, finally, I think it was uh, 
just before Easter, the week, um, we started seeing very few people um, signing up for those workshops. And in a way, we were thrilled that now there were only one or two people signing up to the workshops. We thought, wow, we have met our mass criticality of Zoom workshop training. Yes, we've done it. We can finally move on to other aspects of online learning and teaching. What a concept. So now we've switched the focus. And also because of the demand coming from our academics now was, all right, I can do Zoom, I can get it, that's great, but how do I design a proper video, not just anything I can just record myself? Or how do I actually get my students to interact now? They're not interacting, what do I do? It's like, yes, thank you for those questions. So now we're actually moving towards a model of um, short courses, short asynchronous courses, um, with a bit of synchronous built in, but largely asynchronous courses on topics in those courses, such as how do you interact with your students? What sort of announcements do you send out to your students? Um, how do you facilitate teamwork? How do you maybe grade or give feedback to students online and that sort of thing? So we have these short courses now being offered for our academics as our next stage of professional development, um, moving towards that better notion of, okay, teaching online, what does it look like and what do you have to consider? And also having them as a student in the courses, and we're feeling very strongly that if they experience it as a student, then they can take away from it the positives and the negatives that worked for them and then apply it to their own teaching. Um, like any other teaching experience, you typically take it from your own experiences and then you adapt it for your own students. So it, likewise, actually having them go through these programs as a student online, um, teaching them about online teaching, I think is a, a good way for them to start exploring what works for them and what might not work for them in their different teaching contexts. So it, it is um, exciting to see that change starting to happen. Anyone else? Uh, I know Justin, Matt, you guys have been up to your eyeballs in this space for the last while too. Um, are you noticing uh, some trends or change similar to what Negan was addressing? Yeah, definitely that. And we're also starting to see in instructional design, you kind of naturally have this boomerang effect where people who yeah. don't listen to you, you just kind of let them go and say, well, have fun with this thing that I told you isn't going to work. And then they come back around and say, oh, yeah, that didn't work. Let's go back to what you said. And so we're seeing a lot of that now, people coming back and saying, oh, wait a second, maybe I should try something different than a multiple choice uh, final exam at the end of this class because it's stressing all my students out or something like that. And even more so this week, I, I started noticing a couple of the people who um, it seemed like in the past few weeks, there's a lot of people who could kind of get it on their own, but they wanted some help from us to answer a few things. Uh, and this week, it seems to be the people who have no clue that are kind of coming out and saying, okay, I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't even know how to start somewhere. And you kind of wonder like, well, what have you been doing for two weeks now? Which you probably don't want to know, or it's probably been nothing. But uh, so now we're even having to dig back deeper in and go, okay, now how do I talk with someone who has no idea where to start? They're just looking at their class and saying, I don't even know how to test you know, online. All I know is how to hand out a Scantron. So, um, yeah. So that's, uh, so yeah, I agree with that. And like, yeah, like I said, we had a proposal for a lot of this a few months ago to put a, a bunch of uh, small asynchronous courses online to teach people how to get online. That proposal, that grant was rejected. So I'm not better or anything, but hey, they have their chance. You know, there there is nothing Oh, go ahead, attend. I was going to say we should put together a list of all of our grant proposals this year that were declined, uh, that were related to uh, sort of things like this, like, um, you know, uh, effective practices for online, identifying effective practices online, supporting students online. I'm sure there's a long list of especially federally funded or federal proposals that were not um, selected this year, which hopefully in future years, we'll see more money um, to support those efforts. That sounds like a uh, Festivus airing of grievances session, Tanya. What but are you talking about? Like, literally the day before this happened, I got a great letter from the U.S. Department of Ed, IES, telling me that my um, student's uh, support for online learning readiness was rejected. <laughs> See, and, and that's so that's many people have reached out to me like, how do we know, how do we get online students ready? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, it's 
See, and, and I guess a little bit of that is that there's a lot of people who are at the I told you so stage for good reason. I think Matt brought an interesting point up, which is that the, you, it's been difficult for ed tech people and learning designers and others to be recognized as a craft in its own right. I think a lot of academics and faculty have looked at some of the individuals that help people move curriculum online or help support teaching practices, teaching and learning centers in different universities. I think they've been sort of seen as, a, you know, we'll, we'll just, you know, take what they say pieces here and there, but that's about it. It hasn't been respected as a craft in its own right. And as a result of that, now there's growing recognition that it is that, but there's also a lot of grants and grant reviewers that need to be purged. Like, as I'm sure you know, Tanya, the, the people who are reviewing the grants, they're, they're the problem. And they're, they likely come from a traditional perspective of the, these are not unique crafts in their own right. They're just enabling support systems for faculty to do what faculty do. And that needs to become a slightly different conversation. So I do think it's sort of a golden age for those kinds of departments and practitioners. One of the drawbacks I've seen though in a lot of instances is, which is what we tried to address here somewhat in this course at least, but it's not been a research rigorous perspective in many cases. It's been heavily practitioner based, which is important too, but getting the learning sciences into the conversation seems to be urgently needed. Yeah, I always love the one person either reviewing the article about online learning or the grant proposal about online learning that questions the validity of online learning, no matter what, no matter what article and what journal or what grant to where, there's always that one reviewer that's like, are we sure that people can actually learn online? So that is, um, I think, uh, Marianne was alluding here into the chat, which I think is really important. One of the things I was thinking about, though, after reading the um, reading through some of the discussions, and I might be a little behind, I was reading through online discussions about online discussions. Renato, I know you were in that and a few others. And um, what was really great to see is how many, you know, it's so all these ideas, right? Like, oh, well, we could do this with online discussions. This might even be better in online discussions. I know once it, you know, it took me a while to get online discussions working for me and for my students, not technically, but just, you know, for the pedagogical value and all the other structural components that needed to be in place. It was really awesome. So I think it's great that um, people who are new to online are seeing all um, the potential to do all of these exciting things online. And I really, um, the same thing about, you know, looking at remote working and what a great impact that's having on in, in the environment. So I think it's really great moving forward. Eventually, I think this will be a benefit to universities everywhere because we will be choosing whether it's online or face-to-face -face based on what works best and not what's most comfortable or what have we been doing for the last few hundred years. And so at the end of the day, it could be, and I think it will be, better learning for students, better learning experiences using a wide range of technologies that will enhance their um, digital literacy, better preparing them for a workforce where they most likely now, to some extent, are going to be working remotely, um, you know, and me, and I'm just super stoked about the impact it's going to have on the environment. So there's lots of, um, there's lots of, as much as I'm like, Oh, man, drowning. Um, there's lots of really great things that I can see somewhere down the road. Yeah, absolutely. I think the the opportunities that we're just starting to see are the indirect benefits, the, we, you know, the uh, whatever you want to call it, the constraints. I mean, constraints are in some ways a type of freedom because when you're presented with a series of constraints, you do have an opportunity to rethink and replan. And, I, this isn't, as many people have said, this isn't a done by September thing. This is whatever example you want to take. This is this generation's, uh, you know, Pearl Harbor. This is this generation's World War II. This is this generation's Great Depression. I mean, pick your example. But the what we're experiencing right now will be absorbed and reflected in literature and life experiences for decades for the people who are in it right now. Um, and, and the reason I think that's consequential is 
the, it will have ramifications, as you were beginning to indicate, Tanya, that go well beyond just our interest in digital and online learning. It's going to uh, completely conceivably lead to a rise of a you know, new Green Deal type of initiative, uh, a rise to worker organization that we haven't had in the past. Uh, when your unemployment creeps up to 13 to 15% and the list goes on, you start to see a range of these, these knock-on effects that are going to start to drive it. And it provides many people in higher education with a point of discussion and departure because the best time to change a system is when that system is already in flux. And so I think there are opportunities here for people who are willing to, in spite of being ridiculously and insanely busy, but there are opportunities now for people to begin to vision what could university look like. And, and we're never going to have a more fertile opportunity to move the academy in ways that we find desirable than we have right now. Everybody's been treading water now, but we, are emerging from that water treading to, I think, a period of visioning. And that's reflected in Ed Surge Inside Higher Ed Chronicle uh, articles that are starting to indicate how university presidents and provosts and faculty and support staff are starting to think about this future. So uh, what, what's your take on this from any of you uh, four that what, what do you think um, we could do to help enable that conversation or promote that conversation more so? Well, I think um, Tanya touched on it when she was saying that um, working in the future could very well be different from what it has been and moving towards potentially more remote working, for example. Um, and I think that's part of, I mean, part of the university or the higher education experience is to prepare our students to be work ready. It's to prepare them for the skills that they need to be part of society and to contribute to society and be part of the workforce. So I think it's also going back and looking at what are those graduate capabilities that are going to be needed in society after we get through this pandemic um, and then building that into that university experience. So if, you know, part of, I mean, we've been talking about digital literacy for years. It's not a new concept, but it's, it's going to be a lot more paramount in a lot more fields moving forward after this, if there's going to, you know, keep on the shift of there might be more flexibility in working, there might be more online work opportunities and remote working now that everyone's thrown into having to do it and probably employers realizing that it can work and people can be productive and not slack off. Well, then this might actually be a start to a shift to how people work in the future. So as universities, what sort of skill sets do we need to embed from our undergraduate to our graduate students in order for them to be ready for that? Um, so I think as part of this shift of well, what is higher education going to look like, it's probably going back and looking at what are our graduate capabilities and attributes going to look like moving forward as well. We can run a MOOC on edX. <laughs> No, but in all seriousness, um, I think that um, you know the, the, there are a lot of opportunities for uh, for people to. Um, so I, I think one of the reasons that we we ran this course um, is you know we were we were seeing in particular a lot of uh, knowledge being shared um, that wasn't necessarily grounded in, in good research. So you know there are opportunities for for people to, to curate good good resources that we can continue to share as as, as openly as possible to. That's one thing that, that I at least have been enjoying in, in this is is seeing like there's this um uh, this this uh, cooperation that's been taking place um, where people have been willing to to be to to share things openly to to uh, do things like the instructional you know design hubs that have popped up and other other uh, different groups that that people are willing to to donate time energy in, into some of these things now of course you're going to have um, other people and I know we've I've seen these conversations on on academic Twitter too of uh, you know people taking opportunities for 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 other reasons um, you know I think the you're you're always going to have I, that that kind of thing, but I, but I really have been really encouraged to see just um, different people at different levels reaching out and try, sharing um, the knowledge sharing has just been has been a very encouraging thing to see.
All right. Well, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about things that you've seen in the forum. So last week we sort of uh, had had a really significant bit of uh, interaction around fostering online, and we talked about a number of different topics and resources related to promoting it and to guiding it. So we addressed the the equivalency theorem of you know that Anderson put forward as well. And this week, though, we turned to assessment, we turned to evaluation. Uh, there's not much going on in the forums on that topic currently. There's been a little bit happening. We shared a Dunlosky video that is really a summary of, of a much longer article that some of you may want to dive in because what it really indicates is that a lot of, and his was a meta-analysis, but a lot of what we think is important in learning isn't. And the things that we really promote in classrooms often isn't the most effective way to learn in traditional environments. So that was the, the Dunlosky article, if you get a chance to dive into it. Uh, and it takes it sort of a cognitive uh, psychology lens on learning. Now, the impact of those practices in digital environments hasn't been done. If you look at the most prominent papers that and the resources that have been addressing learning outcomes, learning performance, learning gains, there's a lot of equivalency arguments being made. Namely, we're saying, yes, we should learn yeah, you know, online, we can get similar outcomes with the right kind of design and the list goes on. What hasn't happened is what specific learning processes that are comparable to the Dunlosky article are similarly effective in digital practices. And I think uh, I'm going to throw this out to Tanya because this is sort of an area where you've done quite a bit of work in sort of your distance education uh, research so far, but I'd be interested to hear from specific learning practices, and, and, I, and then we want to move that into the assessment evaluation end, but specific learning practices that you've seen so on, you know, why do you think we haven't addressed that as well as we've seen from in-classroom or cognitive psychology lenses? Why, why is that, or unless you disagree with me, I'd love to have a disagreement as well, but why is that not as well known in this area in distance and digital education? Um, well, I think there's a couple of reasons. I think one, um, and I guess for this discussion, I would like to keep it just to higher ed because I think it's a different discussion if we start talking about K-12. Although I know there's probably K-12 educators, I know for a fact that are, are on here and somebody else can talk to that fact. But what I've learned, um, and especially in my critique of assessment, is that we don't know what learning is, honestly. Um, we're not doing, a, and I am not from education, and so it was something where I was just expecting like there would be an international definition of learning and standardization in the ways in which it was measured, um, using post positivistic and interpretive paradigms and so forth. And that's not really the case. And then I started going backwards because I'm a loser and have lots of time. And so I pulled like all of this stuff, like Bikowski and Piaget, and I already knew Dewey from communication. Um, and I was reading Thorndike and like dove into the last hundred years to figure out what learning is and what is active learning. Um, and all of those sorts of things. And I think there's one thing is that there's not a really um, solid agreement. I think the other issue that we have in higher education, and we've talked about this in several different venues, as well as um, specifically in online education or distance education or however you want to wrap it up, is that we have a interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary lens looking at a phenomenon and everybody is coming from different meta theoretical or paradigmatic stances about it, um, different, you know, disciplinary constructs are informing the way that they look at it. Um, on the other hand, we have all sorts of people that have become educators that know absolutely very little about education. You know, when people were in graduate school, very few people learned how to do more than lecture and to recycle the syllabus that they had as a student. Um, you know, I think I was one of the few 20 years ago when I started my graduate program that there was actually a pedagogy course, which is funny because I actually was the only graduate student that got out of it because there was something else I really needed to pursue um, beyond that pedagogy course, which probably would have saved me a lot of time if I would have had it. Um, 
And I think this goes back to George to what we were talking about with the issue with grant applications, the reviewers of the grant applications and the understanding. I think just like um, I just wrote this chapter on learning sciences and I was like, what is learning sciences? And people were calling me a learning scientist. And I was like, okay, fine, that sounds cool. Um, but I actually dove back um, and situated the rise of learning science within um, actually, um, you know, um, Kuhn's normal science rise. And those parallelisms help me understand it. Probably no one else in the world. Um, but understanding how social science developed from normal science to different ways of looking at um, social phenomenon, in particular in psychology and other areas, made me understand how learning sciences were looking differently at learning. And so we still have a lot of faculty that are looking at learning as students are empty vessels and I'm gonna fill them with my knowledge, this transition model. You know, right now when talking to faculty every day all over the world, that's just how, you know, we're the sage on the stage. I have all the knowledge, knowledge is scarce. Let me um, pour you with my knowledge through my great oratory you know, almost um, thinking of Socrates and Plato and, um, and the rise of rhetoric here. But, but what we know from the last hundred years, see, I thought active learning was new. Like I was like, oh, Chickering and Gamson just came up with this idea and Bonwell and Eilson. And then I'm reading this stuff in like 1913 and I'm like, we knew this over a hundred years ago that this, it was interaction and you know, I'm from communication and a, a lot influenced probably more by sociology and psychology um, and probably anthropology too. But, and it's just um, this idea, I've just always felt that interaction, interaction with the environment or interaction with each other was really key to learning. Um, and communication models and learning models are very similar back from the 60s, if you look at the comparisons of them, or even some of the first models out in the 30s. And so, you know, for me, I think that, um, and this is what I try to do in my research and my work is trying to bring together interdisciplinary teams um, to identify effective practices and to disseminate this information. I think though we run up against, not to take a postmodern perspective, but sort of structures of oppression. Um, and I think we are seeing a rise to a new field when we talk about online learning and online education. Um, you know, but it's just hard to get things moving. Who knows? This might be the pivotal or the critical event in our time that actually leads to us investing in online education as a field. And so, um, you know, I come from communication, from communication technology and computer mediated communication. And it's like that field has just grown so much, um, even though it bridges a few areas. And just to see like this, um, this, internal struggle almost of education, Whew, it's exhausting. I don't know why I'm still, I don't know why I'm still doing it. <laughs> so I don't know if some of you feel the same way about that or, um, but I think, you know, that's like my big picture view of, of why, um, of why this, you know, the idea of learning and assessing learning can be such a challenge. I'll stop now and get off my soapbox before I get too excited. Well, and can we hear, uh, I think, the, the, the topic that flows out of that, because learning determines assessment, or should at least determine assessment, like what your learning goals and learning targets are. Um, what, what do you think are, uh, and this is an open question, everyone, but like, what are you finding with assessment now as you're interacting with faculty? And Negan and Matt and Justin, this may be more directly to you, because I know you're, you're, you guys actually just led a workshop at UTA. Matt and Justin on this on Monday, but can you talk more about what you're seeing around the assessment and evaluation concerns of faculty? Right, well, uh, yeah, Tanya makes a very good point there uh, about learning. One of the things we you usually first dive into, you get in your first instructional design course, is they, they kind of try to scare you by telling us that we have no idea how people really learn what's happening inside the brain. And they say, well, you know, everyone is operating off this, the, the, the mind is a computer type of thing, you're an empty vessel kind of thing, and those different ideas. And that's not even how brain scientists really even look at how brains operate anymore. But hey, by the way, multiple choice tests are kind of based on this idea that, hey, the brain is a computer, and we just get you to output what's in there onto this, question, onto this quiz, and we know what you've learned, and that's it. 
you know, and so, um, so we're operating in a lot of ways in education on a lot of these assumptions that, that are based on kind of older ideas, older metaphors that don't really even, uh, aren't even that modern. And so that's what, we, that's what I try to hit on for the intro to the, um, uh, the assessment session on Monday was that, you know, we don't have a good way of peering inside of someone's brain and seeing what learning actually happened in there. So we're looking at representations, we're looking at artifacts, we're looking at methods to get them to apply what they learned to some task, either a question or a paper or a discussion form or something else. So that is a better way to look at it is that you are creating this task for students to apply what they've learned to that task. And that can lead to a lot of problems because the students may not understand exactly what you're asking. I gave the example of when I back way when I was a eighth grade science teacher that I would have students that would come in and just fail the um, the toss test is what it was called then, at, but they would or the, me, the practice toss test. But then I sit down and ask them. I said, "Well, can you explain this concept to me? Can you explain the tectonic plates? You can you explain volcanoes to me." And they could. It's just they couldn't use the vocabulary that was on the test, um, you know, a, a lot of times there was, uh, since we worked with uh, migrant populations where I taught at, there was, you know, obviously there were some language barriers sometimes, um, but it was, it was a problem with on the testing side and the question writing side, not on the student side and their knowledge side. And so that's the gap that we're trying to figure out how to bridge with assessment is how do we give students this opportunity to uh, show us what they've learned multiple choice questions not always being the best uh, tool for a lot of different reasons and, and we can go into that in more detail but it's it, you know that's that's the that's the difficulty we tried to get at and then we had a lot of uh, faculty come in and give examples of how they did it in different ways in discussion forums with justin you know talked about the assignment banks idea we had a lot of different ideas so hopefully we'll get that um uh permission to use that video in this course as well. So we can hopefully repurpose it here as well. Yeah, thanks Matt and, and I certainly appreciate the, you know, everything is a proxy when we assess learning, you know, until we can directly equate this substructure of neurons firing with this idea being learned. Uh, all of our tests, whether they, uh, and the, the mechanisms that psychologists use for assessing learning or even cognitive states are all proxy driven. You're really saying we see these anomalies and this is what we think is happening. And that's, that's just the nature of it. And, and we need to have a good degree of humility when we start talking about what we understand about learning. And I'm glad you raised that. And if we don't understand learning, then the assessment part is always fascinating because I've used this example numerous times in the past, but a private universe is one of those videos that really impacted me from Annenberg Media, where they took a group of students at Harvard at graduation day and they asked them why we have seasons. And I think it was 21 out of 23 were unable to answer that question. Because, and so here you are, brightest students theoretically, top university in the world theoretically, and they cannot answer a basic science question on graduation. So what they've done is they've clearly jumped through hoops. They've clearly made their way uh, through the programs and done the assessment, but the assessment didn't evaluate the learning the and students are very good at figuring out how to read what's being assessed and play the assessment game so i think that was one of the things that really struck me is is the private universe was you can graduate and answer test questions enough so that you're deemed to be proficient and yet you don't understand a grade five science concept uh, when you're 23 years old it was just you know it, it had stuck with me as the, the limitations of testing and assessment from that lens are, are you guys finding that faculty are uh, mastering this assessment and online or I mean, because that really seems like teaching and learning we've, we've been forced to do it. So we've had to do it a certain way. The assessment is always a bit of a localized black box confined to the instructor, which means how I assess my students is completely different from how anyone else might assess their students. What are you seeing from faculty and are they mastering this or are they sort of lost at sea on the assessment aspect of this. I think assessment is challenging in that when you're talking about your content or your student activities, um, you can change stuff as your semester is rolling around um, and try out different things. With assessment, it's a little bit harder because especially when 
it's halfway through the semester and the assessments are already determined and they're in the syllabus, which for a lot of people is that contract between the teachers and the students or the university and the student, um, which you can still change, but it's much more harder to do so. So changing an activity is the same discussion form um, or putting your content online doesn't have as many implications as changing your assessment task. So I think it's harder in that um, they may need to get approvals for how they change their assessments. They need to communicate that effectively with their students. Um, and they need to also then sort out, well, what does their assessment actually look like? Is it a change to just taking it what was face to face to online or is it changing it completely? So it, you might, maybe it was an exam and now it's a paper. Um, there's a lot to think through. And I think um, there's a lot of struggle with that. And, and again, that speaks to this notion of trying to do everything so rapidly. And if we were to think about, you know, next semester, it gives more time to actually change your assessment type, yet making sure it still meets your learning outcomes. Um, go through whatever approvals your institution has, um, get it ready for the online setup and the delivery. So I think it's a struggle. I think there's still a lot of, um, well, it was an exam before, so I'll just move that to online. Um, okay, how do I put my questions, my multiple choice questions in? Um, that's what I used to do. So now instead of doing it on paper, I'll do it online. Okay, I'll get my head around the fact that it's not invigilated, but really the type of assessment's still the same. So what do I do? Do I hire people to help me put my questions online? Um, I think we're going to have a lot of that right now with, with this quick rapid turnaround of what do I do at the end of the semester? Um, and for us, the end of September the semester is June. Um, but hopefully, again, talking about that next term, um, we have more time to properly think about assessment and how it's aligned with the curriculum and how to actually do it properly online. I think it's a big struggle. And yeah, thanks for that, Negan. I think and some of the questions that, that Laura just dropped in as well are comments. It reflects mine as well. Mine was a leading question. I think out of all the things that go on about online teaching and learning, uh, the assessment part is the one where we're struggling the most. And yeah, there are teaching, if you've got enough time, you can build adaptive uh, or group-based learning or problem-based learning into your curriculum. And you can take a number of different approaches to try and drive the conversation forward with students and improve your teaching and learning. However, assessment and evaluation, uh, it's, it, it's so clunky, it's so rudimentary, it's proctoring services are a big go-to for us webcams, exams, and biometrics, rather than saying, which is an entire culture of distrust. Like we're really saying to our students, we know you're lying, thieving bastards, um, but uh, now please take this test. So I, I think there's, there needs to be a way for us to really advance the assessment and evaluation part of the online learning space in this gap that we have between this semester ending and the next one beginning. I think some of the challenges aren't necessarily at an individual level either. I think it's institutional. So I think um, there's larger changes that need to be done in terms of, say, how assessment changes are approved, the openness of talking about, um, well, maybe it doesn't need to be an exam as the best assessment method, but there's other ways that you can assess the learning outcomes of your students and institutions being a little bit more open to that. So I think it's much more of a systematic issue than an individual um, instructor issue, which is why I think getting over the hurdle of content online, interactivity and activities online is a bit easier because you can work one on one with an academic on that and they don't have the same sort of um, implications to the people that they report to in the institution. So I think that's why assessments more of a struggle because it is a much larger systematic issue. You can't, you know, you can't just go in and change your assessment without considering the other assessment types in your program, you know, um, talking your head of school as to what you're doing. So um, those systematic issues need to be resolved before we can really start having better assessment that's online um, out there. But at the same time as anything else, I think it's a great opportunity for our academics to have um, time to reflect on their courses and look at are my assessments actually assessing the learning outcomes? Because um, sometimes, you know, you teach the same course for so many years or you've taken it on from somebody else and you haven't really had time to reflect on your course and you haven't time, had time to even look at what those learning outcomes are. 
it's been very content driven, for example. So I think it's an opportunity to actually start aligning our learning outcomes with our assessments better and taking that opportunity to actually revise um, what we're doing and how we're assessing our students. So I think it's a great opportunity. Very quick to um, and expand a little bit what Nagan was saying. I know we're wrapping up here, but um, I don't know if any of you have been to the measurement conference at um, the University of Illinois. You can actually get a PhD in measurement. And so there's actually a whole field that just focuses on measurement. Um, I did attend and present some work at that years ago. Um, and so there is a significant amount that goes into measurement and how do we um, measure cognitive skills and those sorts of things. And so um, there are ways that you can set up your exams and your item banks within your LMS or within different systems that help your exams maintain some integrity without having to do proctoring. So, um, and I think we talked a little bit about this before. Matt, I remember us sort of having this conversation, maybe it was in our first week, but you could set up item banks um, in your exam tool in your LMS. You can have them divided by content and by taxonomy, whether it's a recall question or problem solving or so forth. Um, you can add timing. So the research tells us that somebody who has the ability to answer a multiple choice question will do it within 60 seconds. So I give my students 90 seconds for multiple choice exam item. Um, and you can look at the, you can randomize the items, you can randomize the responses. We also have item statistics, we have p-values and point by serials that give us indication of how we can improve our items. So there are ways that we can develop sound uh, measurement and I, it would be great if our universities were spending money uh, to some degree on that, although there is no money and who can spend money on this. Um, I do have some information I, I could share out if folks are interested in how to develop more valid and reliable exams. I think the problem is, is lots of the exams that we have, none of us are psychometricians with a PhD in measurement, and so they're not valid and reliable measures. That's a big issue. And so the um, item banks that the publishers give you, not valid and reliable. There are not psychometricians or people with PhDs in measurements that are um, developing those either. So what you're doing is you're measuring the student's ability, let's say Matt and I, our ability to take a test. Matt and I are super good. I can look at your response options and tell you which ones are automatically not the response option. One tip off is the one that's the right one is longer. You spend more time on it. Um, I you know, used to go around and help people develop these. So anyways, that's one thing. Explaining what Negan said about the institutions, we do have, um, we do have fields like engineering and nursing that have state boards that have to have examinations, um, public health, certain fields. And so those are areas where it's going to be more high stakes testing. So you might have to have some ability to have some proctoring or work with a third party like Pearson View, um, who has remote locations where you can take exams. So there are um, some of those areas there. There are also areas um, and certain fields where I see this more than others, where it's just more difficult to have authentic and meaningful tasks and forms of assessment or certain courses, you know, like Tom 100, like how authentic is anything in that class, you know? Um, so I think there's lots of considerations there, but um, I think it's an opportunity for you to look at your course or courses and say, hey, are there some more meaningful things I could have my students doing that are going to produce evidence that they actually learned what I wanted them to learn this semester? So um, anyways, I will step off of, of that, but I'll look for some of, I think it's probably on my blog or somewhere, some of that psychometric information if some of you are interested in improving your exam banks or your item banks. All right, we're at the uh, end of our time here. So thanks all for joining us and uh, hope you have a great rest of your day. Killing the recording now and we'll see you next week or some of you maybe tomorrow when Dave and I rant. <laughs>